Well, as Scott Morrison has said several times already, this is not your typical budget. It comes in the same week that we expect the 44th Parliament will be dissolved to make way for a July 2 election. And in the lower house alone, 21 MPs are sitting in the chamber for their very last week. Now, two of them are Labor's Anna Burke and the Liberals' Bruce Bilson, with a combined 38 years of parliamentary experience, and both join us now in the studio, scared, I'm sure, by hearing a tally of that magnitude. But to Bruce Bilson, uh, first of all, as small business minister this time last year, you were the star of the show, talking up Tony's tradies, a big jobs and small business package worth five and a half billion dollars. There's talk of more to come mm. in this space this year. Is there any evidence that your exercise last year or what happens this year actually increases spending and employment? Yeah, plenty. Plenty. You saw extraordinary growth numbers in the number of people forming businesses. Uh, the non-mining investment scenario, that's picked up significantly. Uh, jobs growth, I mean, it's small businesses, it's family enterprises that are creating the new jobs. And we've seen strong uh, jobs numbers. The overall growth rate is uh, the envy of many developed economies. Plenty of evidence there. And, and what I'm hearing is this need to energise enterprise, get that entrepreneurial ecosystem right, supportive and nurturing people having a go. That's the way to go. And I'm encouraged to hear that uh, We'll hopefully see more of that in tonight's budget. And maybe more people categorised as small business by changing the definition. What would that achieve? Well, you and I talked about that at the time. Uh, there, there were a range of moving parts. We have to introduced initiatives within our budget capability and one of the things we discussed about then uh, was lifting the threshold for what was defined as a small business uh, that brings some streamlined reporting arrangements improved depreciation arrangements there's a, a package of things that make it easier for businesses that fall within that category to operate their business to manage their books and to focus on their business rather than doing red tape and compliance tasks. All right and a uh, small business not necessarily a core labor constituent but a lot of talk already about personal income taxes and the idea that this anti-bracket creep cut might uh, kick in at around the 80,000 mark. What's Labor arguing there, that uh, it needs to go lower or that you won't support something that's set around the 80,000 mark? What, what's Labor saying? I'd reject that small business is not a Labor constituency. It's not small business. No, it's small business is a constituency for everybody nowadays. If you look at where the workforce is going, traditional Labor areas have now become small business enterprise. Um, we only need to look at what happened recently in respect of trucks. A lot of those were you know employed by big businesses they're now employed on sure. their own with ABN so it's an area that's really fluid and I think Bruce needs to be commended for the work he's done in that space and obviously we're both babies if we've got 38 years <laughs> between us having been <laughs> in Parliament young, here so. but look the $80,000 the bracket creep is an issue but it's not going to resolve the problem for people lower down the scale, especially at the same time if you're taking away family tax benefit A and B. So you're going to give to one end and penalise the other to pay for it. There is a bigger picture that needs to be addressed and we'll wait and see what comes out of the budget tonight. You know, is the... Uh, Hypocritical former senator said, "Is it a you know a sandwich and a milkshake uh, type of tax cut reward?" Nowadays, probably that wouldn't even get you a sandwich and a milkshake. Yeah, I think so we're talking about four dollars yeah. thirty, which some people are equating to a large you know coffee. Well, but I've just been to Aussies. It's four dollars ten. It's not even getting you a large coffee. So where is it? How is it actually going to work? We've actually seen wages decrease and slide. So let's address the whole issue, not just this one usual going into budget, who's giving a bigger cut here, who's spending more there, as opposed to looking at it overall. We've now done 10 different reports into the taxation system. When are we finally going to bite the bullet and do something important? Sure, but the politics are intense here because of the timeline. If nothing else, Labor has to make a decision very, very quickly <coughs> on any bill because we're hearing that this kicks in on the 1st of July. Do you think it untenable for Labor to vote down or, or be seen to try and block? Well, I think it's untenable for the government to ram something through in four days so that they can call a double disillusion election. Like, we literally have between now and Thursday to resolve this. That is unfair to look at all the issues involved. So I think Labor will look at it carefully, but I think the onus is more on Scott Morrison, what he's going to pull out of the rabbit's hat tonight. All right, well, let's look back. Both of you have been here 
Let's use that number again. 38 <laughs> years in total, um, 20 and, and 18. Uh, th that period has spanned a golden era in public finances through to the GFC. And now all subsequent treasurers have had to deal with deficits. Do you despair that this is something, Bruce Bilson, that the nation will live with you know, indefinitely, that it'll be a very long time until there's a national will, even leaving aside a political will, a national will to go on and make the hard decisions? Well, it's it's work that's ahead of all of us. I mean, we, we, you touched briefly on the, the um, mooted tax changes. I mean, that's a step in a direction we need to take. Yeah, we, we need to make sure there's encouragement and incentive, but you need to do that in a way that's affordable. And that's why I think there'll be a new discussion. I mean, small business was the new black. It was the yoga lattes of the last uh, budget. I think this one's going to be different, where we stop talking about the amount of resources that are going into initiative, initiative A or Portfolio B, and we start talking about resourcefulness the wise use of scarce resources. And I think that's going to be a shift that I hope is activated tonight. Otherwise, we gift to our kids debt that they have to pay. That's intergenerational theft. That's not why I got involved in public life. Living within our means and using scarce resources thoughtfully, frugally to get outcomes and focus on how we do that rather than just the quantum of money going in as an input. I think that's the shift that you might see commenced tonight. And, and what do you think on this broader question uh, about a long-term journey out of deficit? Does it bother you that it might take until the early 2020s or do you think harsher decisions might need to be made I sooner? Think we've, got a, we've got hung up on this. We've got to get into surplus, we've got to get into surplus, we've got to get into surplus. You can, if debt is manageable, if we have manageable debt, it's okay to carry it forward. I mean, it's fascinating. We're now having a discussion about reissuing bonds. I can remember sitting in the parliament when Colo Costello said the bonds are dead and we're going to slay the inflation dragon. So you see these things changes over time. We need to have a sensible discussion about what we want. And I'm not sure the public's actually chafing at the bit for tax cuts. What they're looking for is sensible spending measures within our means. I agree with Bruce. We've got to do it within our means. We can't go beyond. But if it's going to damage our ability to provide good health, good education by making savage cuts, as Abbott tried in 2014, that's not going to work either. So you're not necessarily going to be part of this argument, either of you, but is that the the central point in contention for this campaign, that Labor are on the side of... Uh, not giving away incentives and goodies, just trying to repair slowly with the tax net that we've got versus something that is a bit more entrepreneurial and uh, moving on with the tax I, cut. I don't front. think the narrative's changed in my 18 years of being in Parliament. I think you see it in every budget, in every election. And, you know, people say, oh, the two political parties, they're just the same. There's no difference between them. And I think come budget time, you see the differences. And I think it is about a sensible way forward to ensure that we can do what we need to do as government. That's what we're here. We need to do things as government. We need to support people. But at the same time, not taxing businesses or enterprises so much that they're not employing people, they're not making money. We need people to make money so that they can pay taxes. See, I mean, it's that, it's, we've got to get rid of those obstacles and the discouragement for people to take that extra step. Um, you know, you talked earlier about adjustment in tax cut-in rates and, you know, whether 80000 or 85 or whatever it is. I mean, the difference is you go from paying 32 and a half cents for every dollar you earn to 37. Now, and then on top of that, there's some other, other levies as well. Uh, does that discourage someone from taking that extra shift, for doing that extra bit of work? Um, is a small business saying, well, the rate at which I can see a return for mortgaging my house, taking a risk, taking on the responsibility of creating opportunities for myself and others and my community, is that risk uh, reward balance right? Are the obstacles and the headwinds needless and, and disempowering and discouraging? That's the conversation because, you know, we now owe the world money when the Howard government left off office, the world owed us money. Uh, that limits our choices to deal with a far more dynamic world than I think was the one we saw when we were first elected. Things are moving at a rapid space and a rapid pace. Out, further and faster. Um, we, we need to have our best toolkit ready to deal with that and I think that's where the budget repair piece fits into that. And let's pick up on the point that Anna introduces. She says, not much has changed in the central political <coughs> argument in Australia, yet there is a tendency of analysts to say it's more combative, it's uh, winner takes all now. Do you actually think the tone of politics has substantially changed in your time or it is just the robust democracy we've always had? Look, I, I think it has changed. I think it's more shrill now. Um, 
you know, I used to enjoy working in a collaborative way, not just with colleagues in this building, but even in the broader public where you'd tease out, you'd value and you'd respect the input of others and you'd navigate a way forward that was in keeping with your values, but it also carried forward the goals and ambitions of our community and our nation. Now it's almost like it's a, it's a binary conversation. It's either black or it's white. Now, we know in, in life few things are other than grey and, 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 you know, we, we haven't quite got that... Um, sophistication in our conversation and you know frankly that's the audience that members of parliament play to because that seems to be what the electorate is looking for um, whether that amounts to the best um, national interest seeing the light of day I mean uh, that'll be for others to, to navigate uh, after whenever the election's called so yeah. maybe the 2nd of July <laughs> but if you agree with that uh, Anna it sounds like you might what do you think are the drivers of that binary uh, shrillness that Bruce talks about is it so Social media is it expectations on you guys as MPs? Is it the way the the, the larger traditional broadcast media like like this one uh, expect instant answers from you? What do you think are the inputs to that? Yeah, I, I think it has changed, and I think for the worse. The the vective and the personals become far more. You know, it used to be combative, be passionate, and you know, be out there and argue your point passionately. Now it's that personal and that vective, and I think it, to the detriment of all of us. We used to talk about vision. What was the vision? Nobody asks that question anymore. Nobody says, well, what is your actual long-term and visionary thing? Nobody. It is now. What's now? What's in it for me? What's now? Um, even, you know, people were talking the other day about a promo on the ABC. What's in the budget for you tonight? Not what's in the budget for the nation, for the good of our country, but what's in it for me? And I think the 24-hour news cycle, I mean, mm. certainly Bruce and I have seen that change since we've been here. You know, programs like yours weren't here sure. when we started. Twitter, all of that... And people are engaged with it, but not in a deep way. It's a one-liner. Mm. Nobody wants to drill down. And to explain something like bracket creep, sure. you can't do in, you know, how many emojis you're going to send out. So I think that's how to think. But we as members of parliament need to rise to that challenge and I'm not sure we have yet. And some people think this is a generational thing, right, that uh, those of a wartime era sucked it up for the greater good because they didn't have a choice. But people who are, you know, Gen Y, Gen X or maybe even our ages uh, do have more of a, a sense of what's in it for me. Do, do you notice that in, as a dynamic oh, in politics? Really. I mean, I, I, I have great admiration for young people today. I don't think they're anything other than uh, aiming to be the very best that they can be and that's entirely consistent with why I got involved in public life. But the reality is we, we've had you know, nearly 24 years of continuous economic growth. You need to be over the age of 40 to have ever been seen a, a, a contraction in the economy in your adult life. And so in that context, I think that then frames expectations. It frames, you know, what, what the, 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 the diet of knowledge and insight and context that you're fed and, and that it then plays out into what your ambitions are and your hopes for the world. Um, the thing that I got involved in public life for was trying to help people be their best selves. And, and there's an element of hope in, in politics, people vote you in in the hope that you'll do the right thing. Hope is an, is an optimistic emotion. It, 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 it's ambition. It, it looks forward, whereas so much of today, it's the here and now combative. And as, and as Anna touched on, some of this stuff's complicated. If you can't get to the heart of the substance, it's often easier to talk about the sizzle. So have a, have a media story about the aggro and the personalities and what's really going on. That sometimes is easier to deal with than the substantive issue, which can be hard and complex. And, you know, I think people react to that. All right. Well, budgets are all about forecasting. So we're going to ask both of you to make a forecast now. And uh, uh, heaven help us, you were there. Hung Parliament. Likely, do you think, after this election? Oh, who knows? I mean, going back to the last one, we're, we're going to be the first generation to need, leave the next generation worse off. And I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think any of us entered in Parliament to do that. Um, you look at what happened in the UK in respect of hung Parliament. Everybody said going into that election they were going to come out with a hung Parliament. They did no such thing. I think it's going to be a very tight election and I think it's up to the electorate to decide. And I'm not sure. Um, you know, if I'd had some money on Leicester this morning, I'd have been very, very <laughs> happy. But I'm not sure. I don't know if anyone's going to call it correctly. I think it's going to be a day-by-day -day proposition during this campaign. Yeah, the UK was certainly uh, instructive in this sense mm. because not many got the, the, the victory there for the Conservatives. What's, what's your forecast, Bruce? Well, I'm hopeful that the Turnbull government's return because I think the nation needs 
the agenda that the Turnbull government's outlined. It's about the future and a new economy and how we can navigate that and get there. But what I would say is I hope for our country the decision's decisive. Um, I think the Australian public wants someone in charge who will actually implement their election commitments and be held accountable for their performance. And if they don't do a good job, pump them out and get someone else. I think one of the frustrating things of, of recent years is there's not really been someone who's been fully in charge and therefore there's been compromise, which is part of politics, but that then undermines accountability. And the electorate's got frustrated that political parties have promised something or outline a manifesto or an agenda and they've not been able to implement it and then they're held accountable for not being able to do that and the consequences of policies they may well not have advocated for. So I'm hopeful it's a Turnbull government with clear opportunity to implement their program and every opportunity for the Australian public to judge on performance how successful a return Turnbull government will be. Yep, and the great unknown in some of the things you're talking about are what the Senate might look like and how that might work in the next parliament as well. But just finally from both of you, what is it, a, a sense of uh, relief or exhaustion? How does, how does it feel approaching the last week, surreal. Anna? Surreal. Just surreal, because it's like a normal week. We're in budget week. I'm, you know, I've been to caucus. I've been down to have the coffee. I've been writing a speech. I've been reading the papers. It doesn't. It's not going to feel like it's over till it's over. Um, and I think for me, I'm hoping it'll be a shortened Labor government. And I think it'll sink in. Not until the Parliament's recalled and I'm not here. That's when it's really going to hit home. But at the moment, I'm just, I'm just doing my job. You know, answering the phones and doing emails. It really hasn't felt like the end. Yep, and Bruce, you've done your valedictory. It's I almost have. like you've called it on yourself already. Well, well I have it. And, and for me, comparing it with last year is a little bit strange. I mean, going from the engine room of the budget process, uh, at least my eyeballs are in my eye, eye sockets, not on my cheek. So that's quite different. Um, but but uh, surreal and serene, um, you know, trying to make sure your personal feng shui is, is, is OK at a time of great transition. And I've got to be honest with you, you, you miss the people around here. In, in this line of work, you get introduced to, you work with, you associate with remarkable individuals. And, and you know, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm going to miss that. And, uh, and being at the heartbeat of a community that runs through my veins in Dunkley, um, Melbourne's Riviera, how can you not miss being its representative? Hey? Well, I'm sure there'll be people around here who miss both of you and uh, we may not get a chance to talk again before it's uh, pulling up stumps time for both of you. So Bruce Bilson from Dunkley and Anna Burke from Chisholm, thanks so much for joining us today.